Welcome everyone here to West Contracting's plant in Pacific, Missouri. Today we're going to be showing you how a counterflow drum asphalt plant works and how many hardworking people it takes to keep everything clicking here on a daily basis at the plant and how much effort really goes into making a quality, sustainable asphalt mixture. All right, here Kevin and I are standing under the cold feed bins, about to explain how really the cold feed bins are connected to the control house and how they're dropping different aggregate and sand onto the belt that will essentially get fed into the drying drum. The job mix formula starts in the control house. The computer in the control house is linked to these aggregate bins. There's different percentages for each aggregate or sand, which the bins will end up dropping. Kevin can explain that process from the control house to the rock getting onto the belt, how they're kind of synced to each other. We give our job mix formula to the control stack and they will put them in their computer, which will control the speed of the motors on the percentage of how fast it's gonna run. The motors are tuned to either run slower or faster based on the percentage that's going into the mix. A couple of these today are running about 20%, so you can see you know, more of the what looks to be the three A's coming off. Same thing with the sand and the screenings. And as that belt comes around, it's picking up the coarse aggregate first, and then the next coarse aggregate gets layered on top all the way down to the sand. So if you're looking at it overhead, you see what only looks to be sand, but actually all of that rock and the percentages that go into the mix are blended and basically yeah. consistently going up into the drying drum. All right, so we just got done talking about the cold feed bins and all the aggregate getting kind of dropped and piled onto this belt, where then it gets run through a vibrator and a screen. That screen will catch any of the oversized dust clumps that may form in like a screenings pile, kick it out into this offshoot drop off area right here. Everything else then gets shaken through the screens put onto this belt where it's gonna head up to the Waybridge. We'll let Kevin explain the Waybridge here. Waybridge will tell you tons per hour and it will control the bends, how fast they're running and how much oil needs to go in for that tons an hour. It speeds up and slows down everything else from the, the oil meter and valve and the wrap. You're controlling your speed through the Waybridge. Yes. Essentially. Essentially, And yes. that Waybridge is communicating with the bends. The, the bends, the, the... The recycled the, materials, the oil. oil. So. If you speed up or slow down based off the Waybridge, then your, your motors on your cold feed bins are going to go faster or slower. Your oil is going to get injected faster or slower into the mixing drum. Your wrap's going to fall into the mixing drum slower or oh, faster. Yep. I think I realized how crucial the Waybridge is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very important piece of equipment, though. <laughs> From here, we're going to walk over to the belt that takes all the wrap or the reclaimed asphalt pavement up into the mixing drum since the wrap has oil in it. The, the wrap can't go into the drying drum because it would end up coating the drying drum with oil and then yeah. you'll have shit everywhere. Here we are at the wrap bin. This is where we put essentially all of the wrap reclaimed asphalt pavement back into the mix. It's about a three eighths minus or half inch minus material. Most of our mixes are anywhere from 20 to 35% wrap. So this bin is oversized because it's heavier used product and we need to get more of it to the mixing drum. The loader will dump the wrap into the bin. That bin feeds it down to a belt where it goes to a rubble hog that yeah. I'll let Damon explain. It's uh, like a crusher. It's got like little two rotor heads on it. When the uh, big uh, chunks of wrap go through it, it's got teeth that kind of integrate into each other and crushes and makes smaller, which falls onto a screen. Then if it didn't get sized down enough, it'll come off the screen. Right size will go through the screen, up the belt, pass the dryer and drop into the mixer and mix with the rock here. Talk about how we dry the rock. It's a little hard to see, but we've got a large burner up there that actually goes into the drying drum and it's essentially spitting out a huge flame. Yeah. I don't <laughs> and, know how many million BTU it is. Hey, we can figure that out, but it's, it's spitting a big flame out into the middle of the drum. The rock is rolling around the drying drum, basically getting veiled by almost what's like rakes with inside that drying drum. So as the drying drum is turning, that rock is kind of veiling. You're getting the moisture out of it with that burner not burning the rock too much. So you don't want it too far down the line. But once the rock gets down, it's really kind of running on the outside of the yeah, drying drum. Yeah, once you get to your 15, 20 feet, whatever it is, it goes behind the cup buster flights, rock falls behind the flights. So mm -hmm. throughout the drying drum, you've got- Different kinds of flights. You, you've got different flights throughout different segments, probably three different setups. One where it's really tossing the rock in the middle of the drum, 
uh, holding we're... it up against that shell or whatever. Yep. Yeah. And then really towards the end, it's it's encapsulating it so it's not getting hit by the yes. burner. Next, we're going to head over to the bag house, which is the big box behind us that typically in an asphalt plant, you know, where you see anything coming out of, it's usually the bag house. And all that is, is the superheated air that's coming out of the drying drum. Bag house is collecting the dust, but that air is getting pushed through the bag house and then out the top, it's really coming out as steam. It's not any pollutant or anything. Yeah, the moisture and, off the rock. Yeah, yeah it's, what it's, it is. it's really mm -hmm. just the moisture off the rock. So, Damon and I were just talking. This is the screenings. It's really a 3 8 minus crushed limestone that was going into the surface leveling mix today. As you can see here, there's a lot of basically fines within these screenings. All the light stuff, and yeah. it goes into the... If it's heavy fines, they'll drop in the knockdown box, but the rest will go across and hit the bags and stick to the bag, maybe. Then you'll blow the air across the bags and knock the dust back down into the auger and puts it back in the mix. There's so. probably 20 some rows up there, which we use 90 PSI basically to knock them down. So 20 rows of bags that are 14 feet and there's yep. 750 of those bags. Yep. How Something fun is like... it to clean out a bag house? <laughs> Not very fun. <laughs> or change the bags. Bag house parties ain't very nice. How often are you changing them? Change them two years ago, I think. So we okay. did about They'd four or five stay in there for a long time, but as Damon was saying, the, the bag house essentially, it's it's pulsing 90 PSI through there to get the dust off the bags, yeah. back yeah. onto an auger, back into the mixing drum, because again- We don't wanna lose the fines. Don't wanna lose the fines. You built the mix design with this, and you've gotta essentially QC figures out a way to make it be like this. We're just getting to it from a different, yeah. a different mm -hmm. way, at a much higher rate of speed. Here we are standing in front of one of our vertical oil tanks. What they found out over the years is vertical holds heat better than horizontal, as does painting them black. Tank behind me holds how many tons, gallons? About 110 tons, what it should hold. I don't know how many gallon it is, but that's making uh, paperwork out. Five, be 30,000 gallon uh, storage tank for oil. We typically keep 25,000 in there. So you need to have a little bit of breathing room on top. All the pipes and whatnot behind us are kind of your intake and outflow pipes, but we've got it piped where basically weaves around here and goes into the mixing drum. Here at the plant, we've got what? Three different oil Three tanks. different tanks. This one's got a mixer on it too. So you put your heavy oils in here right. with your polymers and it stirs it up and keeps it all mixed up. Uh, here Kevin and I are in front of our EvoTherm tote. We started using EvoTherm, I was say back in like 2012, uh, 13. Yeah, that's uh, it's actually a product that was made by Midwest Vaco that made pencils. Uh, and EvoTherm originally was a byproduct of like wood pulp. Basically the treetops they didn't have anything to do with. And they found out they could make a pulp and create a resin out of it. That was actually a good anti-strip agent for asphalt producers. If you want to talk about anti-strip and what EvoTherm does. We use the EvoTherm in all our mixes to help with a compaction aid and uh, stripping on our super paved mixes. Can I explain stripping, what that is? The stripping is basically where water will get in and peel the oil off your rock and strip the oil off the rock and lose your bonding from your rock. Not uh, the, the stripping overflow. that one would normally think of. Yeah. No, but really, uh, if you think of a rock, take a piece of rock and you're trying to coat asphalt oil on it, if you need that oil, to actually go into the rock a little bit. In the QC process, you're looking at the absorption factors of rock. For an asphalt producer, what's better, low or high absorption? Low absorption. You want low absorption, not extremely low. You need to be able to penetrate the rock a little bit, but low absorption allows you to use less oil. More oil goes into your mix versus inside the rock. EvoTherm, we inject it into the oil. We'll walk over there where it gets injected. There's a percentage of EvoTherm going into the oil and it helped the oil essentially stick to the rock so it doesn't strip off it. And that's what we mean by anti-strip agent, not stripping. As Kevin mentioned, we really use it in most of all of our mixes. Other than being an anti-strip agent, it's also a, a warm mixed asphalt agent. It allows us to actually drop our mix temperatures, which as Steve has mentioned before, allows us to basically consume less energy in the whole plant production process, which I, you look at this, you, kind of consume a lot of energy. Typically a hot mix asphalt is run between 330 and 350 degrees, but the higher you run it, the quicker that mix is going to cool down. Running it at a lower temperature allows you to keep it at that temperature so you can maybe haul longer distances or you've got some wiggle room in your compaction out on the road. Compacting an asphalt mix is different every day based on all the factors you see, rain, whatnot. 
So being able to have it at a temperature for a longer period of time gives you more play in how you're actually compacting the mix. The EvoTherm comes out of our pump, turns about a half a percent to a third of a percent, and through it, it gets injected into the hot oil line here behind me, it gets injected into the mixer over there. Here we are, 415 on Friday, still waiting for the crew to call. Yeah. Whether these guys could go home or not. Yeah. Damon, you want know, to talk about the yeah. magic happening here at the mixing drum? Well, you got your dryer up there where you superheat all your rock. It'll drop all your rock down in the chute here, along with your wrap coming up that belt up there, which drops down in that chute. Then they'll go in this mixer here. Everything should be pretty warm by then. Then your oil will also drop up in the mixer there. Then you got your dust blowing all in there. Then everything will turn and mix three minutes three and a half minutes, somewhere around there, till everything spins and spins, till it comes out of that chute over and in. That should be good asphalt by the time it comes out of there. Hit your drag, goes up your drag to your silos, and just depends on which silo you want to put it in. You got auger up there, it's on a swivel, you, you flip it back and forth, and you can pick which silo you want to put it in up top to store it and load out whenever it's ready. I'll say one thing on the mixing drum, I mean, you've got your aggregate that we talked about, heated 500, 600 degrees, yep. you've got to heat it that much because your oil's going in at 300, 350, but well, then you've got 35% of your mix going in. And that's your, not heated at all. That's not heated at all, your ambient temperature. So you're really looking to balance all of that out. Yep. Here we are standing in front of the silos in the control house yep. where they keep everything in control. <laughs> I've tried to. <laughs> Controlled madness, right? <laughs> Don't explain the silos. That's where I was talking about the auger up top, you can see it's still spinning up there. That's where you can drop your mix in the top of your silos. Unless you got to flip the other way, then the drag will dump it straight into the back one without the auger. You just build up your mix in there so you don't load off the bottom, so you don't wear out the bottom cones. Really, the, the funnel or cone at the bottom is probably what you guys change the most. There's a ceramic that you line it, but that's where the most wear and tear is because that's where the most mix will inevitably sit. They're both 100-ton silos, which is actually a little small for the industry, but it gets us by. Typically in any given day when you guys are busy, they're here 4, 4.30 in the morning, getting the plant fired up and preloading or pre-filling the silos so they're ready for when the trucks show up. We're running one mix, it's easy, fill them both up with that same mix. Otherwise they're changing. They may even have to empty a bin out that we were talking about earlier and put a different type of rock in to make a different kind of mix. We really try and make our mixes with the same variations of rocks so we're not having to shut down and, and yeah. change a whole bin out. That's time consuming, but yeah. So you've got your mix stored up in those silos. There's enough mixing them or they're ready and they're running hard. They'll call a truck up. The truck will tell them what job they're running for. There's usually two or three dumps. Three dumps usually is what we do. Yeah. Three five ton dumps or seven yeah. ton dumps. Yeah, yeah just, just depends on what they want, what they're legal at. <laughs> <laughs> so that clamshell will open up and dump out five or seven tons of mix at a time. Trucks try to get loaded dump in front, dump in back, then a dump in the middle. So that's what they're supposed to do. Try and <laughs> even themselves out. They'll move on out, walk up, get their ticket at the window there. There you go. Hopefully put their tarp down and go. Hopefully they have a tarp. <laughs> Hopefully it's not a rock tarp. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're here at Pacific Lab and we were running a BP-1 in which the test involved an AC content, a gradation, and sometimes we get cores. It all depends on the depth that they're laying the asphalt down on, on the roadway. One of the tests that come in is a core for the BP-1. And this is what it is. It's usually an inch and three quarters or two inches. So once they cut the core and they bring it to the lab, we place it in front of a fan for a wall or we put it in a core dry to dry. After that process, then we take it to our tank and run the core. We weigh it, we write down the initial weight and then we put it in a 25 degrees Celsius tank of water. And it's setting on a scale, submerged in water, and it sits there for four minutes, plus or minus a minute. So that's three to five minutes. So after the three to five minutes, we take another reading of the pour in the water, bring it up, we dry it, pat dry, and we weigh it again. We write down that reading, and then we configure the core compaction which in most uh, cases, it has to be a 92 or better. This here is our NCAT oven. You get our uh, sample, put it in a basket, and put it in here, which will burn off all the AC or oil on the rock and give us our asphalt content of the mix. It will get 
super hot. Right now it's sitting at 536 degrees Celsius. So it'll go up to 650 or so. Basically what it'll do, sit in there and it'll catch on fire and burn off the oil. Calculates the percent loss, which is return your asphalt content. After it gets done burned off, we will let it cool and run our gradation on the mix to see where we're at. I hope you've learned something new today. Not everyone gets to see what people do here or how an asphalt plant operates. I don't think many people understand how complicated it can actually be, how much goes into trying to make every single ton of mix accurate, truthfully, and sustainable and, and conscientious. I know we running the warm mix asphalt additive, lowering mix temperatures, running 35% wrap, are trying to be as sustainable as we can. Again, I hope everyone kind of understands how complicated all of this can be. Because one, one minor hiccup okay. here on any of this can couple hours of madness can create <laughs> havoc especially when you got 30 dump trucks in line yeah. uh, no pressure <laughs> get it going <laughs> thank you again for joining us today i hope you were able to learn something here at our asphalt plant in pacific about how an asphalt plant works and what the men and women here have to watch out for on every given day and how complicated it can actually be